In the previous section then we've looked at the column and the mobile phase but we can't run an analysis just by having a column and a mobile phase. We need uh, a system that is built up around about that to allow the column and the mobile phase to work. So a typical HPLC system then is comprised of four main modules. The pump which moves the mobile phase through the column. An auto sampler which injects the sample onto the column column thermostat which maintains the column at a very stable temperature and some kind of detector which detects the compounds once they've separated and are looted from the column. There are lots of different types of detectors that we have within HPLC. The most common one we see is an ultraviolet detector and that is often abbreviated to either UV ultraviolet, DAD, a diode array detector or PDA, a photodiode array detector. They're all basically a very similar thing that we use uh, an ultraviolet light source as the, the method of detection. Fluorescence is a derivative of the UV detector where we measure the uh, ability of a compound to re-emit energy, light energy. A mass spectrometer, MS, um, is a, a very complex but increasingly very common mode of detection. Um, evaporative light scattering detector, ELSD, charged aerosol detector, CAD, and a refractive index detector, RI, and also various types of electrochemical detectors, ECDs. So the main manufacturers of the HPLC equipment, the systems, would be Agilent, by far the most common, Thermo, Dionix, um, and Waters. Uh, three main brands that you're likely to see out there in labs that are doing HPLC. Shimadzu are also uh, starting to see a little bit more of Shimadzu. The pump then is responsible for moving the mobile phase through the system and what we have is a set of pump heads that take mobile phase and move that along and then pump it through the column and out to the eventually to the detector. It also proportionates the mixtures of solvents if we're using a gradient method, so it mixes the organic and the water. One half of the pump would deal with the water, one half would deal with the organic, and then blend them together in here to produce the optimal mixture. It also usually contains a vacuum degasser to remove dissolved gases and prevent bubbles forming in the system itself. The auto sampler then, um, it removes an accurate volume of sample from a vial, it injects it into the mobile phase and that is then carried on to the column. So if we look at this here, um, this is an animation that shows us how the HPLC auto sampler gets the sample out of the vial and removes it from the vial. We then get the vial back in the rack, needle in, the valve switches round and the sample is flushed onto the column. So it's effectively just a two-way valve but there are a lot of robotics on there which also um, get the sample out, move the vial about and inject things at the right time and start the software going. The thermostat, this section here, so we've got the mobile phases, they go into a degasser, then into the pump then into the auto sampler, that injects the material onto the column which sits in a heated compartment and the reason we need a stabilised compartment is that retention time varies with temperature and to maintain stability in the system to keep constant retention time the column is enclosed in a thermostated depart, uh, compartment. The last unit on the system is the detector and the most common one we see is an ultraviolet visible detector. So most organic substances absorb UV visible light and the wavelength of light that's absorbed is dependent on the chemical structure of the substance being measured. Compounds with higher conjugation, with higher amounts of carbon-carbon double bonds, will absorb higher levels of ultraviolet light and will do so at higher wavelengths of ultraviolet light and that makes it more specific. Shorter wavelengths have higher energy and as we approach 200 nanometers more and more substances absorb. A 
and we're much, much more prone to interference at lower wavelengths, we will detect more and more contaminating substances at lower wavelengths. And we'll get to the stage where the mobile, fail, mobile phase itself will start to absorb. Any UV active contamination in water will um, result in higher absorption for the mobile phase, so we get very high noise, but it will also potentially generate contaminating peaks in the chromatogram. So this is how a UV detector works. We have a UV lamp here, which um, the, the light is manipulated through various paths. We have a, a grating here, which selects the wavelength of light. We can either go very low near the, the blue end of the spectrum or up to the visible red end. Uh, we pick the wavelength of light. We illuminate the flow cell. So the sample comes out of the end of the column flows into this cell and then out to waste. Any substance that travels through the cell that absorbs ultraviolet light will reduce the intensity of the light reaching the detection diode on this side. So it's very simple. Any substances that absorb UV light will absorb some of the light that the instrument is shining through the flow cell and reduce the intensity of light that reaches the diode. Mass spectrometer is a much more complex type of detector and it detects substances coming out of the column but it also tells us their molecular weight and other structural information. So rather than us just getting a peak in the chromatogram at a particular retention time, we get a, a mass spectrum which has a whole lot more structural information. For a mass spectrometer to work, the substance needs to be ionised. Uh, it needs to be charged. A mass spectrometer will only work with substances that have a charge, a positive or a negative charge on them. The mobile phase eluting from the column is ionised, so we apply a, a voltage to that that um, promotes the formation of ions in the mobile phase. That mobile phase is then sprayed out, it's nebulised as a, an aerosol, and then we evaporate off all the liquid in the mobile phase. The water that we use for mass spectrometry is critical, the quality of it. MS is extremely sensitive and small levels of pretty well any types of impurity will be easily detected. The ionisation of compounds is extremely complex and it's hugely affected by small levels of organic and inorganic substances. And if we don't get stable ionisation, then we get signals in the mass spectrometer that are all over the place that causes all sorts of problems. All mobile phase components for LCMS need to be fully volatile and any poorly volatile contaminants that come in with the water will deposit in the MS and cause significant degeneration in the instrument performance. In addition to that, several Key substances, if they appear as minute levels of contamination, the, the obvious ones are sodium and potassium, form adducts with the target compound, and these appear at different mass to charge ratio and they greatly reduce the sensitivity of the mass spec detector. So, this is what happens inside the MS. We have a spray tube here, so this is the substances coming out of the end of the column, sprayed out of here, they form little droplets. The droplets get smaller and smaller as they travel across towards the mass spectrometer, and the substance is ionised, and now we're dealing in the currency that the mass spectrometer can deal with. So, it's sprayed out, the mobile phase is evaporated off. And in this process here, the substance is liberated as a charged version, which the mass spectrometer can then detect.